Hello everyone, welcome back to the Houston Zoo. We're gonna visit one of the least visited areas of the zoo, but one of the coolest today. So if you guys will come along, Julie and I will tell you all about the bug house. in our collection here today. So you'll see this one in a moment. Uh, I'm gonna get this one out first. Uh, this is Carmen. She is a Lassadora Parahibana. That is a salmon pink bird eater tarantula. She is a tarantula. And tarantulas are related to spiders. Think of them kind of as the uh, ancestors to the spiders you'll see in your garden. So Carmen she is a mature tarantula, but she is not, uh, she's still young, I think is the best way to put it. She's still young and she's also still small. So tarantulas have this amazing story where the females, the girls, never stop growing. So she's going to continue to molt or shed her skin throughout her lifetime. We think she's around seven years old about that but she could live well into her 20s. So she's got a lot of time left. And by the time she's an old lady, she's actually gonna be a two-hander. You can see she barely fits on one hand now. And I'm gonna need both hands to hold her uh, when she becomes older. Now, we call her a salmon pink bird eater. The salmon pink comes from the coloration, but the bird eater part, that's not so accurate. So. The name has been around for a long time, and uh, she, uh, they don't really eat birds, they generally eat bugs, uh, but the name has been around and it's going to stick, uh, it's just what we call them. But don't mind too much the bird eater part, that's not very accurate. So we have a question, uh, Amanda asks, does she have babies? So she does not, uh, we don't have a male here in our collection, so she does not have babies. She's old enough to have them, uh, but that's, it takes a lot of space to rear little tiny tarantulas. So she is on her own. She is uh, what we would call an ambassador. She does a lot of education like this. She's very used to sitting on my hand. You do see that I'm wearing gloves, but that's because she has some itchy hairs on her. And so uh, I wear the gloves just so that my hand doesn't get itchy from having her sitting on me. Uh, Kayla asks, does she build a web? That's a fantastic question. So she does not build a web like the spiders in your garden do, but she does spin silk. We uh, look at her back end here. These are spinnerets, and that's where the silk comes from. And she uses her silk to do things like build little mats and help build her house. She'll make a den, she'll make a floor mat, She'll use it to make doorways. She'll even use it to make highways to her favorite places. So that's what she's going to use her silk for. Uh, the webs you see in your garden, those are spiders catching uh, food for themselves. She doesn't need to use a web to catch food. Um, so that's where she differs from the spiders in your garden. Uh, Carla asks, why is she hairy? That's a fantastic question. Uh, the truth is, nobody really seems to know we are right now. So a lot of spiders have hairs of different kinds. Now they can be sensory hairs. Uh, they can uh, help detect prey or predators or what's going on in the world around them. Um, so that probably is part of why she has hairs, why she's completely covered. We don't know yet. Scientists are still studying these things. So maybe when you, uh, if you are a young person, maybe when you become an adult, you can help us study tarantulas and help us find the answer to that. Uh, Mandy asks, is she venomous? So the answer to that is yes, she is venomous. She has uh, a pair of fangs on the front of her face, but she, the venom is mild and she only uses it to catch her prey. She is not going to bite. Uh, so that is to uh, basically catch her food with. So this is a salmon pink bird eater tarantula, if you are just turning in. She is a young uh, female tarantula, but she is not anywhere near 
stopping growing. She's going to continue to grow throughout her lifetime. So she is still young and still small. And uh, Adelise asks, why are you wearing gloves to hold her? And that is because she does have some itchy hairs on her hand, I'm sorry, on her back. Um, so the gloves are to help me uh, protect myself against any itchy hairs that she has. So as a defense mechanism, she can actually make them come out. So she could take her back leg and rub it against her back and those hairs would actually dislodge. So uh, that is her way of protecting herself. Uh, and uh, so the itchy, the itchy hairs are not fun to have in your hand. Uh, and uh, what Lillian asks, what do uh, they eat? Uh, they eat a variety of small invertebrates. So other bugs tends to be their favorite. Her favorite are cockroaches. So, <laughs> uh, which is kind of handy. Um, but yeah, they, they do eat a lot of uh, other bugs. Uh, scientists are still studying their diets. So we don't know exactly what they eat all the time, but they do love bugs. Uh, Melissa asks, how many eyes does she have? That is a super question. I am not entirely sure how many eyes she has. I need to look that up. She does have more than one. Uh, the eyes are small. They're on top of her head. She doesn't see very well. She sees in black and white. She sees movement. She sees shadows, but her feet are actually uh, what tell her most about her world. So her feet are super sensitive to vibration and uh, so she'll feel vibrations around her and that's how she knows what's going on. Uh, Amanda asks, does she molt? She does molt. Um, she is still molting yearly. Uh, she grows quite a bit every time she molts. She will never stop molting. She will molt her entire life and she could live into her 20s. So uh, she's got got a long time and a lot of growing up to do. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take our mantis out real quick too so you guys can see that. Um, so I'll place Carmen back in here. She's super used to this, so she'll just kind of back right onto her log. Um, see, these guys are gentle giants. A lot of people are afraid of tarantulas, but it took very little time to get us to the point where she'll do this and she doesn't seem to mind at all. Um, these guys are great. These are from Brazil. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but this is a Brazilian species from the Atlantic coast. They are forest dwellers, so they do need forests to survive. So helping us protect forested land goes a long ways to help protect bugs like these. Uh, this is a female mantis. This is a dead leaf mantis. This is an African species. She is an adult. And uh, she's actually a mom mantis. She has egg cases and some babies in the back. Uh, these guys are carnivorous, so they eat other bugs. Uh, we like to give them crickets. I'm gonna try to turn her around here. She has excellent eyesight. Mantis have fantastic vision in general. So she's probably staring into the camera, trying to figure out what all of you are doing at home right now. Uh, so. She's called a dead leaf mantis because if you take a look at her wings here and her back and her shield, she looks like a crumpled up dry leaf. So uh, that's just kind of what they use for camouflage. Um, and uh, they basically, they're, they're just trying to hide from other predators. They're, they're not toxic, they're not venomous. So they would make a nice snack for somebody else. But if you can hide, you're uh, not gonna become somebody else's meal and it's also gonna help you catch your food. Uh, Daniela asks, is a female bigger than the male? That answer is yes. So the females are quite a bit bigger than the males. Also, the males are skinnier. The girls, you'll see she's pretty chunky. She's still generating eggs. So the males, they're pretty skinny and they're also really good flyers, but they're smaller because they'll actually ride around on the female's back for uh, several hours at a time. So uh, yes, they are definitely smaller uh, than the female. Uh, Savon asks, how fast do they move? I've never clocked a mantis. Uh, our mantis actually can move pretty quickly when they want to. Uh, this is kind of the, I'm just curious what's going on speed, but when they need to get away, they will run. So, and they can also fly. So there is that as well. Hard to catch a flying mantis. Uh, Stacy asks, how old can they get? 
So it depends on species. This is a species that lives about a year and a half, and that's really pretty good for mantids. A lot of them clock around a year. Uh, and now that it's spring, the local ones in your gardens can start hatching. So uh, if you have a garden, go out and take a peek because you might start seeing little mantids on your plants around there. These are great to have around. They're great for pest control. So please love the mantids in your garden and let them be. They, uh, they're gonna do you a lot of good. Uh, Jessica asks, are they endangered? Uh, not that we know of. Mantids are pretty adaptive and they'll live in human environments and undisturbed environments, but there are a lot of mantids that we still don't know a lot about. So uh, although I say we don't know for sure, it's possible that some could become endangered. So we need to protect all of our bugs and our uh, wild lands because they house so many different kinds of insects and other animals uh, that we don't know the numbers of. Cynthia asks, could they bite humans? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. So the short answer is, theoretically, they can. Uh, they don't generally. That's not how they really work. Um, but if you're messing with their mouth parts and make them mad, eh, maybe because they're trying to get away from you. But they're uh, generally gentle giants. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, pack this one up, and we're going to uh, take a look at our ants and move toward the back of our uh, bug house. So I'm just going to go ahead and put her here. Uh, she's just going to go in this box for a few minutes. This is a nice little resting spot for her. They love to hang, so she's just trying to get to the top and hang like she uh, would normally. All right. Yeah, so this? we're going to show you one of the native species to Texas. These are Texas leaf cutter ants. And if you look as they're coming down the branch right there, many of them are carrying leaves. And you can see kind of winding back and forth. Some have leaves, some don't. I think some ants are a little bit harder worker than other ants. But what they're doing is they're cutting those leaves and they're farmers. So they take it down underground. And you can see down here at the bottom. That is their fungus that you can see down here. And they grow the fungus under the ground and that's what feeds the larva and all of the ants is the fungus that's here. So if the fungus starts getting a little too dry, they'll cut things that are really wet or moist. If it starts getting a little too wet, then they'll cut things that are a little bit drier, but they're pretty fascinating. And they can strip the leaves off of a tree in no time at all. You don't find too many right here in Houston, but just a little further north and to the west, you could find leaf cutter ants. And these ants are supposed to be here, unlike the fire ants that you may see in your yard. Those are an invasive species that are not supposed to be here. But we like these uh, leaf cutter ants. And any insects that you have in your yard is a good thing because lots of insects are pollinators. So having lots of pollinator plants, little places for them to drink water is a good thing to keep those insects around. So uh, we have a question from Julia wanting to know how big can an ant get? So they have lots of different sizes. One of the things that's unique about uh, leaf cutter ants is they have different size ants for different purposes. So they have some soldier ants that they're designed just for protecting. They have little minima workers that are so tiny you could barely see them. Or you could have a queen and the queen is the biggest of all and that's the one that you really don't ever see. She stays buried underground within the fungus. But all of the ants that you see here are all female. So you have a queen and then you have a whole bunch of workers that she has produced. We're gonna move on to the back area and give you a glimpse of some of our really cool behind the scenes area of the bug house. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the ants when we get there. So we're gonna to have to go through a little door Keeping insects contained is very, very important. So we have to go into this vestibule first and we'll shut the door behind us and then we can open a secondary door and that'll lead us to the back side of the bug house. All right, you can come on in here. So you're seeing the backs of our exhibits uh, and this is really special. This is uh, one of our really big exhibits. This is for our walking sticks. We have two different kinds of walking sticks in here. They're from Malaysia. So you won't find them in your backyard, but they're super cool. Now stick insects eat plants. 
So you're like, where are the bugs in here? They all look like plants. And that's exactly what makes them so special is they are fantastic plant mimics. So one type of insect that we have in here is the jungle nymph. This is a female. You can see that she mimics a broad leaf. Uh, she's also covered in spines. So she's very spiky. That's gonna protect her from uh, predation right there. She would not be fun to get in your mouth. So anything that grabs her lets go because that's not so much fun to eat. Uh, now this is a female. The males uh, are actually smaller. They're brown and they have wings. Uh, but believe it or not, being brown in this exhibit does not make you stand out any better. <laughs> uh, so we also have, these are giant wingless stick insects. There's two here. This is a pair. This one up here is the male. This longer one is the female. Uh, the female actually is not full grown yet. She's actually going to get longer. So her front legs end way up here and her tail is down here and she's going to get bigger. This species of insect, it's actually a bamboo mimic. So you see that she blends in super well with our bamboo plants in here. Here's another male down here. You'll see that they've got the little segments on their body and that just helps them. Uh, they look like a little bamboo shoot and they're actually hard to find in here. So we play where's that bug every day. Uh, we open this up and check on them and we really never know where anyone's truly at. We have to kind of look in here for several minutes. So along with bamboo, uh, we give them some other plants as well. They get, uh, this is a plant called Fortinia red tip. They also eat rose and even ginger. Uh, so these are some of their favorites. Uh, we change this out. We have to give them new plants at least once a week, sometimes two or three. Uh, Brianne asks, where are they from? These are Malaysian species. So these are both from Malaysia. They will not be found in your backyard. So we have the, um, we have the giant wingless walking stick. This is the male. And then we've got the jungle nymph here, which is the female, which is very spiky. Oh, yep, she's saying hi. <laughs> I'm still here. So they do hatch in here too. So we have eggs and the babies hatch in this exhibit. So, uh, so Julie, one of the things that's really cool is these insects are found in the same areas that you could find orangutans out in the wild. Yes. So and yeah. Yeah, we absolutely. have some conservation partners, uh, thanks to your support that are working in Borneo planting trees because just like orangutans need trees, these stick insects and jungle nymphs need trees as well to survive. Yes, so protecting our plant life, our forests and our uh, woodlands are all extremely important because they need those to survive. So please, if you are looking for great ways to preserve green spaces, uh, you know, planting trees, plants, especially your native plants are really important to help saving wildlife here as well. So a couple questions, Maria asks, are they venomous? No, these rely solely on their camouflage to protect themselves. So uh, there is nothing here that can hurt you. And Tucker asks, can they bite? So the answer to that is also no. Their mouth parts are too small. Uh, they do have defense mechanisms. The, the jungle nymph, the really spiny kid, uh, she's going to use her spines to her advantage, so sometimes she'll try to pinch. Um, if she gets too upset, the male will just fly away. But they don't bite. They're not interested in us. Uh, we're just, we're not, not something they're interested in. They only want their plants. And Terry asks, could you describe their eggs? Yes. Better yet, I might be able to show you one. Let's see if I can find one. So they look like little seeds, and they just drop them on the ground. So a lot of times I'll go through here and just kind of look and see if I can spot one. Oh, this is a, a jungle nymph egg. So they lay really large eggs. Uh, they'll often bury them. They've got a point on their abdomen. They'll actually sometimes dig holes and bury their eggs. This will take about nine months to hatch. So human gestation for, <laughs> for a bug. <laughs> Uh, the giant wingless walking sticks, that's their egg. Huge difference in size. 
uh, their eggs take less time to hatch out and the babies are also smaller. So I think we were able to get, this is a hatchling here, this is a baby giant wingless walking stick. So you see it has a lot of growing left to do and it's gonna take at least six months for it to reach its full size. But yeah, so we get the eggs, they just drop them in the soil and then we check on them uh, just to make sure we're getting good hatchlings and stuff like that throughout our year. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close this and let them have their space. And uh, we'll go see a couple more things here real quick. Uh, we're gonna go take a look at the uh, ant exhibit from back here. So you can come on back. Kevin, I'll let you go ahead and take this one here. Yeah, so this is the back of the leaf cutter ant display. This is where we provide leaves for them. So you can see we have a camera set up. So a lot of times you log on and we have a webcam that are showing the leaf cutter ants. That is zoomed right in on the leaves. And if you take a look, they're pretty active. Some of them have leaves in their mouth and some of them are working on cutting leaves. So uh, the leaf cutter ants have one side of their mouth that is the cutting side and the other side of their mouth is more like the plier side. So as they pierce through the leaf, they kind of inch their way with the sharp side to cut off a round piece of leaf and then they'll carry that down to the chamber. And look at them, just going right up the vine here to the top through the tubes that you could see over here and then that enters the exhibit that we saw just a few minutes ago. One of the things that's pretty neat about leaf cutter ants is uh, out in the wild, usually about one time a year during the spring, they will produce winged males and winged females. They will go up at night, usually a moonless night, they'll fly into the air, they will mate and then drop to the ground. After that, the males die, we don't need them anymore. The female will continue to live on and she loses her wings. So the fungus that we saw earlier, she has to take a little bit of that fungus from her uh, colony that she was born from and then she'll take that underground, kind of like the starter for bread and then she'll start to grow her own fungus. So she has this special little cheek pouch that's in the, uh, the back there. These ants are quite strong, but you can see they'll just grab onto that leaf and carry it right over their head all the way to the fungus chambers that you saw. They do have ants that kind of scout out and look for uh, new leaves to find. And once they find it, they come back, they tell the colony and they lay a chemical trail so they know exactly where to go to get the leaves. Jason's wanted to know, how do they determine who the queen is? So whenever the queen is producing eggs at a certain time, she'll produce different types of eggs. And so that once a year, they will produce winged females. And from that, you, it becomes a, a queen. But after that moment, this leaf cutter ant queen, she could live 10 years, maybe even longer, and she'll continue to produce thousands and thousands and thousands of ants and they can have colonies up to 2 million ants out in the wild. So Damien Salazar, it's your third birthday today. That is awesome. So happy to hear that you're celebrating your birthday with us and with the ants here. Happy birthday. Hope you guys are doing well at home. So another thing that's kind of neat about the leaf cutter ants is we don't make their fungus, they make their own. We just provide the leaves. But another thing that they do for us is they help to clean the exhibit. So if you'll look right over here, you can see this aquarium that's in the corner, that is their dump. They're very, very clean insects. So as things get dirty on exhibit or their waste, they don't want it anywhere near their fungus. They don't want it anywhere near where they're eating. And so they will carry it and they'll put it in the dump for us. So they're so nice. And then all we have to do is go scoop it out of there and throw it in the trash. But they uh, not only are farmers, but they're also uh, waste workers too. So the question is, what happens if the queen dies? And that's from uh, Michael. Uh, so if the queen dies, the whole colony will die unless there's multiple queens. So a lot of times in the wild, you may have four or five or more queens that are our part of a colony. Uh, but if you only have one queen, if she dies, then eventually the rest of the colony will die as well. You see how strong they are? It's fascinating the way they could just carry those leaves straight up and they don't waste any time or any space. They know exactly where the leaves are. 
They know exactly where they need to take it and they follow that trail. So everyone's kind of pitching in, helping out uh, with the leaves that are in here. One of the things that we have to make sure is we keep plenty of leaves there because if they see leaves nearby, sometimes they're very creative in figuring out ways to get out of their aquarium to go over to the leaves that are on the bucket. So we keep them happy by keeping the leaves exactly where they want it and then they stay put. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today. This is really fun for us to do and we really enjoy getting you a chance to see some of our behind the scenes areas. So thanks so much. If you can right now, go to HoustonZoo.org and we do have the emergency zoo fund. So all of the work that the keepers are doing, keeping the animals healthy, keeping them happy while we're closed, we need your support right now more than ever. So log on to HoustonZoo.org and go to that emergency zoo fund and tune in next week. So coming back on Monday, we'll be here at 11 o'clock and we hope to see you then. All right. Good night, everybody.